this is our podcast, Coexist, hosted by myself, Sukhani Kobel, and Ashe Kobel. And we are, hey, <laughs> our, <laughs> this journey is to basically explore creatives within the African diaspora and share their art with all those that care to listen. And today we have with us Vincent Cobell. All right. Our father. He is a creative and a poet. And we grew up watching him. So it was only right that Father's Day passed a few weeks ago for us to have him on here and for him to share his background and his journey and his art. Well, first of all, good afternoon, my loves. It's great to be on here with you and to be a part of of your program as well. I'm going to open, before I start talking, I like to let the art speak. And I just want to open up with this piece called A Flame With Jazz. A dozen shirt pockets full of people, 11 baskets full of marbles, 10 hats full of black crows with scratch and sniff feathers, nine pints of midnight, eight wheelbarrows full of railroad rhythm, seven gut buckets full of blues, six jars full of pickled pig feet, five pans full of hot white cornbread, four teaspoons full of smiles, three bowls full of kosher salt, two hands full of kisses, and one shovel full of dominoes. We come battering music and cornmeal and salt and pepper. Music, music, music taken by the fingers of the ears and rubbed, then sniffed up by the nose. These notes are like little sisters laughing around, giggling at each other from the jokes they tell with their eyes. They smell good. And the grandmother note, flickering like a candle lit, lighted, sketched across the street is the smell of sweet basil. Perfumes my nose with jazz fire and you smell it too. Salt peanuts, salt peanuts roasting, salt peanuts, salt peanuts, gasoline and cigarettes, baby oil and coffee, Garlic, garlic funk and toasted bread. And the drummer, plays drums like, like a j -j drunk man, s -s -s stumbling, f -f 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 fumbling the, the, the drums. The, 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 the drums, tri tripping, slipping, but just in time, he catches his feet. Mumbling, stumbling, something about the way she smiles. She smiles way, smiles she way, she smiles way, she way smiles. Way smiles she, way smiles she, a flame with jazz, a flame with jazz, way she smiles, a flame, yeah. All right, that's my opening piece right there. And uh, I started writing poetry as a teenager, you know, secretly. I was secretly writing poetry and just putting my feelings on the page. Um, I was definitely influenced by the neighborhood I grew up in, in, which is the Mission District of San Francisco. And taking in all the different people that were there in the city of San Francisco, but especially um, the Chicanos and uh, Central Americans um, in the mission and, and, and the influence of the murals on me. And that opening piece is the influence of jazz, you know, it's black music, it's American classical music and it is mine. You understand, I, I love jazz. My, my dad will come home from the shipyards on Friday and that was like the best time to be around my dad when he was grinding, trying to put food in the pot and feed a family of five. On Friday night, he'd come home from work and he put on that jazz. I mean, I, I, I grew up listening to John Coltrane, Miles Davis, um, Joe Pass, uh, Youssef Latif, 
And so that's just like a, you know, integral part of who I am uh, as an artist. I guess even if I wasn't an artist, it, it would still be a part of who I am. So I love improvisation. I love the jazz aesthetic, right? And so that's why I wanted to open with that because that when you when you when you're creative and you actually do that, it actually feeds me. It um I don't get drained like there's certain things where you feel drained at the end of a job. You're just like, oh man, I just want to want to go home. But when I'm doing this, I'm being fed, you know, and I'm more alive. And so that's why it's always been therapy for me, right? It's always been what I love to do, you know, uh, because of all of that. And then I could deal with my own issues, you know, mentally, physically, spiritually, psychologically through my poetry. All right. Wow, thank you. Oh. Yeah, thank you. All yeah, right. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. And um I'm I'm curious why why a flame with jazz? Where does the flame come in? A flame is like being on fire, almost like a um a dry ground being on fire. And to me, jazz is like a fire. It's a fire that burns. And it, it's a fire that burns it, it it's new. You know, like with the African American aesthetic, it's it's new in the moment. It's you know, and um, I love all kinds of music. Don't get me wrong, right? Uh, I listen to classical and all kinds of different types of music, rock and yeah, R and B. But when you're doing that improvising in the moment, you're trying to say something true to that moment, and you're trying to create something new, and not keep it exactly the same way. So there's a challenge as a musician, a classical musician can play all the notes right, but if they got the feeling wrong, then it's, to, it, it's not right, right? And so that's the challenge with that, whereas the jazz musician is trying to create on the spot and also to have that feeling be true every night, right? Within the frame of a particular piece, but as a poet, so for that opening piece, I kind of wanted to improvise a little bit and um, kind of just kind of feel the moment with my lovely daughters, you know, who have been such an inspiration for me and just giving me purpose in my life. And I'm so thankful. And I thank God for the two of you. I thank God for my wife and um, that I'm here talking to you guys. I'm, I have yes, nice. deep gratitude for that. Yeah. yeah. No, we appreciate it. And just even within you talking, you talked about music influence, art influence, and how that influenced your art in poetry. Right. So I think even with our name coexist, it all is encompassing. Everyone that is around us, everything that around us is an influent, influence. That's right. It makes us who we are and it made you who you are and the artist you are. And we just want to appreciate that, you know? And yes. Right, I wanted to add something. Um, when you were talking, it made me think of like, you guys said, well, what's my, what's my influence? I remember as a kid, I might've been three, four or five years old watching my mom, right? My mom is the black woman from the Caribbean, listening to my mom speak Spanish and how alive she came. I was like, I want to do that with language because, um, the way people speak is poetry. That was my first big influence was my mom was my first big influence. Even though I didn't understand, here's my brother Dave right there. Um, yeah. Well, here's brother Tish. You, brought, see you guys just improvised something. There's Dave. Bring him back. Hey, there's hey, Dave's okay. painting. We come back real quick. Come back. Here we go. No, he's gone. I say it's okay. Here we go. This is Dave's okay, okay, painting. Okay. This was my piece. Let's go to uh, Dave's painting. I gotta go. I gotta go to it. Okay, Dave. Okay. Love you. Who's just showing me your painting? This is a uh, textures of pregnancy. These are the poems. Um, that I wrote as a father, you know, um, about the, your pregnancy, about about your pregnancy, you know, in your mom, right? So these are these are my collection dealing with that with those um, moments and um, those pressures, um, you know, what I was going through as your father um, with your pregnancies, and I I wanted to do something new, and I had I hadn't seen. I hadn't seen or read any poems like that 
Mm. Especially from a man I hadn't seen her. And so then that, that's why I, why I wanted to do it. It's almost like a document and it's where I was at that time. And then I asked, I asked your uncle David, who was a phenomenal painter, um, mm -hmm. to paint, to, to paint the cover for the, for this, for, for my poems. And then behind me is your, your grandfather's painting, paintings of the double bottoms of the shipyard. Him. Wow. And the other shipyard workers would go under into the double bottoms to the bottom of the ship and it would just get smaller and smaller. And from my conversations with one of my dad's best friends, Joe Tyson, Joe Bryack, and my father, they would have nightmares about maybe being stuck in those double bottoms. So anyway, I gave you two paintings, you know. Uh, there's creatives the in the family. Done by grandpa. That's, this is by A.C. Cobelt, your grandfather, wow. my father. Okay. And then wow. I showed you, showed you Dave, who's a, also another phenomenal painter. So there you got, you got the, crea the creative energy all around you right here, behind so, and in front. How do you, um, all these painters around you, where do the words come in? Where do you feel like your gift of words comes in? Well, I t well like what I was saying is that when I was a kid watching my mom speak, right? There was poetry in the way people speak and how alive uh, she became. And I wanted to do that with my words. She was my first influence, wow. for sure. Jeanette, Duzon Son Cobell. And when I go back and yeah. I think back, I was like, wow, I wanna, I wanna be able to talk the way my mom, mom talks, right? And Me to too. do that with language, <laughs> very colorful. Yeah. Caribbean um, language, whether English, Spanish, or French, we're a very colorful people, regardless of the language that that we speak, right? And my mom is a trilinguist, so and so are her sisters and her brothers. So I kind of, before Actually, we came into the United States, stuff. before we came into the United States, I, I I grew up hearing all of that, so I was taking all of that in. Wow. Wow. And then my, I had a few other questions, like the voice in the beginning of your poem. Are you channeling uh, another, like, yeah. like, is there a character that you're channeling or like, um, another, another part of yourself that you're yeah, channeling? Right. For me, like, like one of the, the mother river, the mother river of jazz is, is like the Mississippi and that goes into New Orleans. And, um, What's that song, uh, what, the song? Um, uh, yeah, anyway, so uh, I wanted to, uh, Under a Blanket of Blue. Under a blanket of blue. Oh, just you wow, and I, I that in a long time. beneath the sky. You know who that is? You know Satchmo? Yeah. That's Satchmo, like, so that's, that's going to that, the grandfather, Satchmo, I, yeah, the grandfather of jazz. Yeah. The grandfather of jazz. It does his shirt pockets full of people. 11 baskets full of marbles. So I'm going, I'm going to New Orleans. I'm going to the, to the, to the Mother River, the Mississippi Delta. At least that's my attempt to open up that way. That just came to me too. Um, when, I, when I wrote that poem uh, years back, mm -hmm. the voice came. To, that would be like the intro before I read the rest of the poem. So it was a way wow. to honor Satchmo. Rest power to Satchmo. Oh, for sure. Wow. You know, yeah. <laughs> And that's that's cool. And then I was wondering also, like, it kind of had like a twelve days of Christmas feel to it because of the oh, okay. Oh, uh, okay. So uh, you know what? Yeah. Where I got that is um, one of the master poets out of Los Angeles is Kamal Dawood, and he has these poems okay. where he has numbers, where he has like numbers that he puts in before he gets to the one. He has a he he has a book called The Language of Saxophones. Wow. And okay. that was an influence there. I was like, wow, okay. So it's also, yeah, an homage to Kamal Dawood too, um, with his list poem. So I did the list and then the rest of the poem came. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna read a yeah, piece okay. since, since you got the Caribbean thing going there. I'm gonna read a piece right here. Okay. Hey, hey, okay. I got your book in my room. Which book is that? I don't know that? why I didn't think to uh, bring it, but 
um, you got you have some good St. Martin pieces in that book. Like, wow. Which book is that? The one with Sakani. You're holding Sakani. Oh yeah, yeah. I got that here too. Like, I found yeah, that. I got upstairs that. When we were cleaning. And you know what? You're right That's next cleaning. to me in that too. Both of I you guys are me. out there with me at the open mic. Oh, the camera your dress it. that you could see the tilt of your dress is the angle they took the picture. Yeah, in, that you can't you can't see yourself. But wow, I have Sakani because she's wow. the baby, and you're right next to me. And yeah, the people wow. just people fell in love with that. That's Nobody was doing nice that movie. at the time. Let me tell you, like when I was pushing your baby carriage and Sakani's baby carriage, there was nobody on the campus yeah. of UC that no fathers. That's what I meant. The mother's always been doing it. So mad love to the mothers who've been hold, yeah. holding it together. Uh, there wasn't any fathers pushing on baby carriages at that time. Now, when you go to Davis, you see a lot more. I was like, I was the only one at that time. Okay, I'm gonna read this piece. Um, this is called Pinch of Salt uh, for my grandfather. And Ashe is actually sitting on the porch that my grandfather and my uncles built. We call it Mom George's Porch, which is my grandmother's name. Twas a pinch of salt grandfather took on his way to cut sugar cane. Pinch of salt, pinch of salt. Working from can see in the morning to can see at night. The hot Caribbean sun blazing his neck, beads of sweat sliding down his back. He grips the machete in his hand and swings it low. Swing low, machete. Machete, swing low. You got to know what to do when you know you got to do. Tom pop, tom pop, tom pop. Are you grandpa? Backbone bent up. Bent up backbone. Sweat like sugarcane rum. Work and work and work, and work, and work. He stopped for a while, right alongside the deepest blue meadow of the Caribbean. Meadow, meadow, meadow. Twas a pinch of salt. The sweetest thing to his mouth was my grandmother's fingers to his lip. Pinch of salt, pinch of salt. Are you? That's for that's for um, George Emmanuel Duzanson. Are you? C'est très bien. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so oh, it's yeah. so crazy. Uh, I'm gonna let Sakani answer uh, ask some questions, but it's just so crazy. Like uh, things make so much more sense being over here. Right. And. Um, even just visiting over here, it, it, things click so much more. Um, right. But you're definitely yeah. bringing, yeah, it's like you're bringing a taste of the Caribbean, but um, not everything clicks until you actually come to the Caribbean, you know, so. It, it, and, but I try to keep it alive at home, but it was, yeah. you weren't, you in the wrong setting, so you couldn't understand the family, you couldn't understand the culture. I mean, you couldn't understand, well, why is he playing this? It doesn't seem like it relates. But when you come to say, why you go you to say Martin. Some of the things you would say, like yeah. the way you would say your words, like, why is my dad talking like that? <laughs> right. And like, then now you're around the family members, so you understand it. it. Yeah. yeah. We have our own slang, our own stuff. Yeah. Our own language. Yeah. Or our yeah. own Creole, and in a way. Creole, mm -hmm. sometimes. It's just, you don't realize it's different when you're <laughs> yeah. than when you're American. The yes. mindset is different. Even when you're talking about, you know, talking about them working and yes, like we do have people that, you know, put in a lot of work effort and blue collar. You're talking about them being in the field. Right. It's also, I think like, the way you talk about your family is just, uh, even outside of your poetry, you wanted to make sure that we knew it. So right. I think what I think what I wanted to ask is how you felt like you needed to, you talked about how you need to get that out and how maybe other people, when they're struggling, 
to handle their emotions and what's going on with their lives and who they are, where would you tell them to, to go? Right. You, you know, um, like when you're going through a, like a difficult spot, a hard, a hard spot in your life, or you're going through a crisis, number one, you know, you find somebody that you could talk to. It's not everybody that you could talk to, right? Some things click. And so there are certain people that bring certain things out in you. And when, you, when you're able to share and articulate how you feel and somebody can bring that out, that definitely helps you to see yourself. And, um, and ba what I want to say is to get the medicine, like my time here with um, indigenous brothers here in California and uh, my, my Chicano friends that uh, introduced me to indigenous ways of, uh, of knowledge is that there's, there's a certain medicine that people have, right? And you find that person that gives you that medicine so that you could talk and articulate yourself and what you're going through. And one of the key things sometimes is not a talk. It could be a walk. You go on a walk. I went through a tough time uh, one time on this one job and, and I would go walking by the American river and mm -hmm. that kind of helped me, you know, walking by the American river. So walks are important. Talks are important, but definitely, um, as a creative, um, doing my poetry too, to get it out and then kind of like transform anger into something creative, right? And then that changes you to then to where you're not angry anymore and you don't have to just do a knee jerk reaction. Somebody did this and now I got to do this. You release that anger and then you think about what you're going to do, right? Sometimes you got to do things right in the spot, depending on what it is. Other times you got to reflect. You can't always be knee jerk the knee-jerk reaction. So it's like a shift of energy, maybe, like from mm. what may be chaos to then something that's creative. That's, that's right. Yeah, so yeah, something that could be chaotic or something's sorrow, uh, confusion. You're confused, and so you put that confusion on the page, and you can begin to figure out what you're confused about or what you're going through yeah know. i was the same with the caribbean aspect um i guess when did you you said like your mother was a, was influential so when did you feel like you needed to go and experience it for yourself uh yeah so in 1976 we we left saint martin we flew into Puerto Rico and in San Juan. And then from San Juan, we flew in in Chicago. I can still remember the snow. And from Chicago, we flew into San Francisco and we moved into the Fillmore district. And my dad had us, you know, he, he, had, he had preceded us by months to find a place for us to be. And so I kind of just, from 76 to 89, Right. We were we were just basically in the States, in Northern California. And those are crucial years from six uh, to 19, somewhere six, yeah, six to 19. So that's how I came to know myself. But when my mom said, OK, when your little brother graduates and he's the last, he's the baby, David's the baby, then I'm going back to the islands. So I had completed two years at UC Davis. And I knew then that I was going with my mom. Me, um, my mom, Dave, and myself, we all flew to St. Martin. My dad still had to work in Portland to finish up um, his ship, his elect, you know, his shipyard career to get his retirement. So the three of us flew to St. Martin and I was there in St. Martin for about two years. I think those were crucial. That was a crucial time to kind of get away uh, to learn more about my roots and to connect with the family because otherwise it's just talk. Talk is cheap. And you say family is, is relationships, right? If you know, so I had to meet people and know them. They had to know me, know me and I will know you, you know, we're family. You got to know, you got to know the family. And 
Otherwise, it's just talk. Those relationships are not developed. Just like mm. for me to talk about to you guys, oh, your family in St. Martin, and then you guys were ne never, you know, you guys hadn't been there. So those relationships weren't developed. And But when you went there, so many things connected for you, right? So many realizations, you know, right? Because you knew you guys have a strong bond with your mom's family in, here in California. And you knew that, but I wanted to make sure that you guys also knew my side of the family as well, who's, a, who's the other half of you, right? And that's important to know that, to know the characters that, <laughs> that are, who are a part of you, right? It's a lot of characters. Especially like my dad and mom, so that, that's key. But then there's so many other characters too that it, it, it provides um, medicine, as I said before. It provides a certain medicine, not mental medicine, physical, psychological, all of that uh, to understand um, how, you know, black people in the islands do it. And you realize okay. it's like, it's a village. When you understand that, you understand it's a village. We might not have a lot, but we have each other. And we stick, we stick with each other. We might not always agree, but we realize the big picture is that we stick together. And I hope we always keep that. We have like a, a, fo a folkloric uh, tradition of doing certain things, just stopping by. Like people just stopping by, like Baba just came by there. Right. That's, you know, that, that's really nice. You know, people are always checking on each other. And we don't have that in the States. Yeah, it's not the same. So it's just different, you know, there's pros and cons to each place, but it's good to know. So yeah, I'm gonna. So I'm gonna um, just give you guys two haiku right here. Okay. Just yeah. to have a little exhale moment. Okay. Right. Here's my haiku. How to get started? Searching for word pinatas to strike with a pen. That's one. Here's the other one. There is a scissors that cuts black night like paper. Sweet summer morning. Oh, here's, here's, here's one too. This one I wrote in Palmdale uh, when I, I got a sunburn on my lip. I didn't think I could get sunburned. And the sun in the desert is ooh, it's, it's a whole nother level. Can't tell you nothing, said sun to my sunburned lips, but you shall go learn. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. I think this is like the visual imagery that I person get with those poems is just, I was like, dang, like, I can see exactly what you're talking about. Right. Very cool. Well, I try to paint with words. I try to paint with words, and you could see that I was around artists. So I don't, I don't have the, the, the dexterity to paint like my dad and Dave. I try to do it like my mom with words. <laughs> I feel it. Shay, you have a question? Yeah, I want to know, like, your advice for the youth out there who are starting their creative um, endeavors and their creative careers. But then also, how do you balance as a creative with a family because you've been doing it for so long? Right. To me, it's an integral part of who I am. Like, we were watching the, what was it, the Red Table Talk? Mm -hmm. And it will, I just give mad props to Jada and Will, yeah. and I just love the interview. And what they said and what Will was saying something about when he realized he wanted to be a father and he was a boy. I realized I wanted to be a father when I was a boy, you know, and what there was that? things. Yeah, I, I knew it. And then I was like, um, he said, well, I could do this better than my dad. And I had the same thought, too. And <laughs> you know what I mean? I had to, and then you realize how hard <laughs> it is actually um, um, to be a father. So and then, you, you know, you end up having a lot of. Um, respect um, for, for your father, you know, and the fathers who came, who came before. And so my advice is to, for I can speak as a poet, it's like, if I let my, let my poetry go, I, then I, I, would have, I, I would be a broken man. The poetry has been kind of like a glue for me, right? To be present. I knew I wanted to be present with you guys. I knew I, you know, that I was gonna be there to walk you guys to school. I was gonna be there to cook with you guys. 
and have these talks with you guys. And when I go through the imagery, like, boom, like we're, we're in Davis and then San Francisco, and then we're in, in St. Elmo's Village and Baja's coming by and you guys are getting the, um, you're hearing the drums and we're, and then there's yoga classes, Kundalini yoga classes, and you guys are seeing me do Tai Chi and reading my poetry. All of that I think is, um, has been good for me because I held on to who I am just naturally. I, I'm just like, I'm a poet. And so I, that's what I have to do. And so you got to hold on to that, right? And you, you can't have these preconceived concepts of what it means to make it, right? Nah, so I made it right here with my relationships with my daughters and my wife. And poetry has been an integral part in maintaining, maintaining those relationships, right? Processing those relationships. That, wow, that's so what I would say. Helps you make, wow, okay. It's been, it's been key, it's been crucial, right? It's been a crucial I, part of who I am and how I deal with the world and how I deal with the husband-wife thing. And then realizing too that the, the, there's more than just the husband. We, we gotta be friends, you know? I gotta like being around you. We gotta, you know, we see things differently. So because it can't just be expectations. It's, it's like, oh, I expect you to do this and you expect me to do that, right? Because then that becomes a tit for tat and a, a ping pong game. So hard to maintain any type of romance like that when it's just business all the time. Now, those some things have to be maintained and taken care of, right? But we still got to know each other. We still got to be able to talk to each other. Things can't just be assumed because we're husband and wife, right? We're not only husband and wife, but we're father and mother, right? We're not, not just father and mother, but we're friends because that's how we got together. So I met your mom at UC Davis and we fell in love with each other, right? And then when you guys came into the picture, that's like, that changed everything because our lives came, became about you. And so at the same time we had to maintain, which is difficult and we, you know, it's, those are difficult things, but we had to maintain our relationship while at the same time being father and mother, husband and wife, right? Friends, was put to the background. But for me as a poet, it's like, no, that's a crucial part of who we are. Everything kind of emanates from our connection together, right? Our relationship yeah. with each other. Even though we have these different things that are pulling on each other, and we definitely want to make sure, okay, priority is parenting and make sure we give you guys everything that we can so that you guys can be the beautiful human beings you've turned out to be, right? Um, so then we just wanted to make sure we nur nurtured your physical self, mental, spiritual, and psychological selves. And of course, somewhere along the line, we came up short, but we gave what we, we gave everything we had. You know what I mean? And then we could look yes, and say, oh, we could have done a little bit better here, a little, could have done a little, you know, because we make mistakes. Yeah. And the beautiful thing is just to get back to the jazz thing. Miles Davis says, if somebody makes a mistake on the bandstand, you musicians don't stop. Oh, you made a mistake. Now you go with the mistake. Now we're gonna learn, we're gonna learn with that mistake. And we're gonna grow with that mistake. And that, that's how I actually grew, growing up in the barrio, in the hood, in the mission. I saw my older brother make a mistake and I learned from the mistake. Not to put him down, but it's like, now I don't have to make that mistake, right? right? And so that, that's been part of my learning process. You know, I know I digress, but. No, yeah. Um, just how did you keep, I guess, playing jazz and not get into, let me do what society tells me to do or what psychologically, like right. outer external forces kind of play on you of who you should or shouldn't be and what you should and shouldn't do. Like, how did you keep just being like. Wow, oh, wow. And do what's in especially here. in your time yeah right. that was just like 80s 90s right yeah mm. that's your youth yeah maybe you're still young but you know you're your first youth i guess wow how did i say that again connie how did i how did you keep playing jazz i guess going with doing poetry because yeah because it's not like i play an instrument 
I mean, I, yeah, but I know what you mean. Like I'm playing jazz with my poetry. You exactly right. That is my instrument, and um, that's such a powerful question. How did I was able to keep myself and what I wanted? You know what? Some of that had to do with um. You you know there's a saying you know you know the double dutch right? I've never been figured. I've never figured out how to get in get in with the double dutch right now the double dutch is an african-american activity right and a lot of times young african-american girls would, would do that especially for my generation and we could say that the double dutch is almost like a each rope is like for, for african-americans you have the, the european rope and the african rope and then in the middle you're creating a new culture right between the two right you're creating th this new culture and so for me too being african american and mixed at the same time it's like we're an ethnicity within the african american community and we've been since this uh since these plantations are on the americas this is where we've been because of things that you have learned about the one drop law and words like mulatto and and Zambo and all these different things, they, that's how the African-American community was created. And it differs a little bit from place to place, but pretty much, pretty much the same. And so I'm saying that to say this, we're caught between two. And your father was caught between two. My dad chose San Francisco because he didn't want us going through racial prejudice that we could have gone through in Montana and other places, which could have scarred us. So for his African-American family, as a white man, right? San Francisco was the best place to do that. And here we were in the mission because my mom spoke Spanish as a black woman, right? And then our Caribbean foods are all are all there it's the same as like it's the same as the latino foods so there's definitely a kinship there with culture um definitely a kinship there but how to maintain this thing with jazz how to maintain myself so i was a long-haired kid and i was one of the only boys with long hair i was the boy with crazy hair and so i had friends but i never i was already outside i was an outsider Right? And I didn't have any, I wasn't conscious of being an outsider. We were outsiders in the mission in the mission as Caribbean people. Right? But we and but it still was it that. was yeah. it was still a the best place for us to be. At least my mom felt more at home there than than she felt in the film more. And she was accepted more because she was a foreign Negro a lot of times, um, at that time. And um, I was already an outsider, and so I didn't, I didn't really care about that. I didn't really care about fitting in with anybody. I was just myself, and, and uh, that's how I was able to maintain. It was like I was unconscious of all of these things. My parents, do, I didn't grow, I, I, I wasn't raised to be within any particular group. They just let us be, and they raised us the best they could. And we had to figure out these things in the United States. My mom really didn't know exactly how things worked um, as a black black woman for black people in the United States. So um, we had to kind of figure it, things yeah. out. And, and I think Annalisa, my sister, was a prodigy in figuring out how this whole thing was gonna go culturally for us. And, and how I got through, I just gotta thank God, you know, thank my mom's prayers and just blessed I, I you know to get through uh the mission in the 80s without a without a drug habit and you know and so yeah. many other things i kind of get caught up into i didn't get caught up into it because i was aloof and i was a imaginative and kid and i, I just wanted to do my own thing right and I, I liked what i liked you know and i did i was in i like for hip-hop i i loved houdini you know the freaks come out at night and then friends how many of us How have them? Us have but <laughs> that's right. But the dictionary doesn't know the meaning of friends, right? A friend is someone who knows all about you but likes you anyway. And so 
Mm. We gotta be careful about who we surround ourselves with. Like, do they have our back or not? Or, you know, cause we're all gonna make mistakes. Will the friend be there or will they try to exploit? So your real friends, you know, will be there for you. That's real talk. The dictionary does not know the meaning of friends. And so, yeah, that's some of it. Some of what I, I was able to do. So this is for the fathers of Treat Street. We watched you lay down the grass at Candlestick Park as we sat on our couches. Look, hi, Miss Fathers on TV. After I threw a football into the belly of the gray blue sky, falling towards Damien, I took a glance at you, six bags in one hand and your fingertips milk white. And Juan's father's face, no strain at all, his eyes steady through his glasses. Ed's father played me Lola Beltran's Paloma up above the 24th Street traffic as Ed's supply of new skin lotion stood on the living room table. I could hear the needle hitting the record and then we didn't know what it was to be a man then about the, so the joys and sorrows of life. And my dad pulling up in that white 57 Chevy smooth to the touch. We could all hear it a block away as he came home from doing electrical work down by the waterfront of the city. He didn't play ball with us like we saw on reruns of Leave it to Beaver. But we didn't need that then because we had each other. A tribe of children afloat, a flutter, aloof through the maze of the mission. No, not Lord of the Flies, but boys of the fun. For the fathers of Treat Street, it's not what you said, but what you did day in and day out that lets my eyes drip with rum. Take a shot, just like the hardworking men we come from. Wow. There's a picture. Wow, yeah. Yeah, you and your day, your wedding day. Right. There it is right there. Oh, nice, nice. 